welcome back. The gang is all here. It's time for Behind the Book with Hawk Koch. Uh, Freda, Hawk, Bob, so glad to have you all here. And I can't wait to hear more from A. Scott Berg. Enjoy the program. I don't want to take up any time because this is going to be a really exciting and wonderful interview. Um, Scott has covered so much ground and Hawk, I'm sure you'll take us through all of it and his connection to MPTF. So thank you everybody for being here and over to you, Hawk. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Sorry, we had a few technical difficulties. I think Beecher screwed everything up, but I don't want to <laughs> say anybody personally. Uh, but today I'm honored to get to speak with A. Scott Berg, Pulitzer Prize winning five-time best-selling author of American biographies, Max Perkins, editor genius, Goldwyn, a biography, Lindbergh, Kate Remembered, and Wilson. Scott has written and co-produced two documentary films, directed by William Wyler as one, Goldwyn, the man and his movies, the other. He also wrote the story for the film Making Love, collaborated on the script of Hoosiers, was a consulting producer on Billy Ray's miniseries The Last Tycoon, served as a producer on the film Genius, which was about Max Perkins. He serves on the board of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History and is a charter trustee of Princeton University and as a life trustee of the Library of America, for which he edited one of its recent volumes, World War I and America, told by the Americans who lived it. Scott is currently working on the biography of Thurgood Marshall. Wow, I mean, what a career. Please welcome Scott Bird. Hey, Scott, how you doing? I'm doing okay. I, I just, I'm there. There you are. Just, oh, good. just reading a few of your accomplishments is uh, mind boggling. Uh, it's, I made a movie called Wayne's World and it's, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And there's so many stories, we've only got 90 minutes. So we'll, I'll Thanks. try and get as much in as we can. Uh, and good. I wanna start at the beginning. Uh, I know your dad was a television, maybe movie producer as well. Tell us about where you grew up and, and what home life was like with two obviously other accomplished brothers and, and your family. Uh, well, home life was, in, was mostly in Brentwood uh, where my father in his mid thirties became, uh, we, all, we originally lived in Westport, Connecticut but we moved out here in 1958. When my father changed careers, he had he was in the art supplies and uh, gallery business in Westport, and then we moved out here where he became a writer and then a producer, mostly of television. Uh, he made a few movies, but he really much preferred the pace of television. So I grew up in that household. Um, my three brothers actually are all in show business. Uh, my brother Jeff uh, has been agent most of his life. I've, I've heard of um, him. Yeah, I heard of yes, him. mostly at, at international creative management. My brother Tony has been in the music business as a first as a performer and as a composer and arranger and then a record producer for most of his life. And my kid brother Rick has been a producer and manager and agent also. And I okay, should sorry. not fail to mention, I should also mention my mother who when all the kids grew up and left the house, uh, went back to college, which she had not finished because like so many women in the 1940s, uh, she left college to, to get married and have children. Uh, when we all left, she went back to UCLA and uh, got her degree in history, uh, the only Phi Beta Kappa key in our house, and, um, and went on to get advanced degrees, got her master's in history and all but her PhD. She never wrote the dissertation uh, because suddenly grandmotherhood interfered. Uh, but uh, I, that's I'm the sorry, family. I'm sorry. I'm sorry your, your family's not very accomplished. It's really <laughs> well, upsetting. We all work hard. I will say that. And, we, now, and, and, and amazingly, we all get along. That is, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as a kid, were you like sitting in your room reading books or, or were you going to the movies with the rest of your family? What, 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 what were you loving as a kid? I was, until I was about 15, a 
television idiot. I just watched so much television. Um, I mean, it's really possibly the subject I know most about is 1950s television uh, for a thousand, Alex. So Lucy, um, Sergeant Bilko. You name them. Yeah, you know, that was that was mother's milk for me. Right. Um, and, and then around the 10th, well, the 11th grade, actually, at Palisades High School, uh, we had to write the obligatory report on an American author. And I was just stumped. I didn't know who to write about. And I discussed this with my parents who said, of course, you don't know who to write about because you've never read anybody. Um, <laughs> and it was and it was my mother who suggested that I uh, I write about F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, because, as family lore goes, uh, she said in her final pangs of pregnancy with me, she was reading F. Scott Fitzgerald, and by God, she was going to give birth to a son, and his name would be Scott, and and there it is. I, I thank God every day she wasn't reading Charlotte Bronte. Um, so. I became a, a Fitzgerald maniac. By the time I graduated from high school, I had literally read every word by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I think every word about him, at least that had been published in the English language. I went through my school library, the local library, uh, the UCLA library. Um, so by the time it came time to apply to college, there was really only one school I seriously considered, and that was Fitzgerald's alma mater, which was Princeton. And, um, and that was what my application was all about. And Whether was, you take me or not, I'm doing a pilgrimage. So wow. make it easy on yourselves, guys. I'm coming. But, but had, they if, you were, if you were doing television, you were watching TV, then they told you to do a, a, uh, a, a report on Fitzgerald. <laughs> Did all of a sudden the TV get turned off and you were just there going crazy? I, that is it, exactly. I really became ravenous and I was making up for a lot of lost time. Um, yeah, and I remember when it first came up when my parents suggested um, that I write about Fitzgerald. And, and I remember my mother said, well, you know, we have all his books in the library. And I said, we have a library? I, <laughs> um, oh, you mean the TV room? All, oh, and sure enough, there was the big TV set and surrounded by shelves of books. Who noticed, you know? But there they were. Um, so once, once you started, you, you did the book report or whatever it was yeah. on, on Fitzgerald, you started reading. Were you also starting to write as well? Were you, when did you find out that writing was something you enjoyed? Um, I'm, I'm still waiting for that day. Um, <laughs> no, cheap joke. Actually, I love writing. Um, I, I began to love it in college uh, when a professor in particular took me under wing, a man named Carlos Baker, who was Hemingway's biographer. And he became my advisor. And for starting sophomore year, he, he really created me and changed my life. I'm mean, perhaps, oh. more, well, not perhaps, more than anybody beyond my parents. Well, so my next question you just answered, which was, was there a mentor that encouraged you? And I guess that was him. He was the man. Wow. Um, I also, when I went off to school, I mean, uh, I had more than a flirtation with becoming an actor for a while. Uh, and I did a lot of theater at Princeton. And as senior year was coming around, I had come upon a subject I wanted to write my senior thesis on, and that was Maxwell Perkins, the great American book editor, uh, the man who literally discovered and developed F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe, to say little of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, Ring Lardner, James Jones, Taylor Caldwell, Erskine Caldwell. I mean, I could give you 50 of the most important writers in America in the 20th century. One man discovered them all and really stuck with them for their entire careers. And I thought, well, gee, this could be an interesting senior thesis. And I always in the back of my mind was thinking beyond a thesis, this could be a great book. And it was this man, Carlos Baker, my Princeton professor, uh, who said, yes, this is a great book. And as senior year rolled around, he didn't suggest to me, he urged to me, if not even insisted, as I remember, that I cut all the other extracurriculars for senior year 
And he said, you know, you were the star of the Triangle Show at Princeton last year. Don't you want to be the star of the English department this year? Why don't you, why don't you write that thesis and turn it into a book? And so it began. And he really was there for me all the time. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, you won the English department prize for your thesis on Max Brecker. I, I did. And, and better than the prize, which I was happy to get, and the A+, plus, which my parents were happy I got, um, when they passed back my thesis, it was three single-spaced pages reporting on the thesis saying, this is not really a senior thesis. It's really the first draft of a book. And we hope Mr. Bird will continue to turn this into a book. Um, what they failed to tell me in that little memo was that it would take another seven years to do that. But okay, so now you, that's you, what I did. You graduated Princeton. You know you yeah. want to write a book on Max Perkins. Do you get a job? Do you go to a publisher? How does I know it took seven years to get it done? What were you doing in those seven years? I mean, obviously I, you were writing. I was doing nothing but that book. And here's where I really locked out. And that's in my choice of parents. Um, my parents said to me, look, if you wanted to become a doctor, we could afford and we would pay for you to go to med school. Uh, if you wanted to be a lawyer, we would do the same for law school. You want to write this book, you can move back home if you like. And your, your old bedroom is there. Uh, and we'll give you three squares a day. And, and that's what they did. And, and I said, well, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, that's great. I do feel a little funny. And, and I remember, again, it was my mother who said, so what are you going to do? I mean, work in a bookstore for eight hours a day and then come home and maybe squeeze in an hour or two of research and writing. I mean, this book will take 60 years to write at that rate. I mean, biographies are, are basically five to 10 year projects, if not longer. Um, and we all recognize that. And so the, the best thing seemed to be for me to move home um, and to basically take up residence and start, uh, start writing. And that's wow. what I did. Good, good for you and good for your parents. Good on and them, definitely. As all of us have, a little luck is involved. Because, uh, yeah, no question about that. Yeah, right. you know, I mean, it was it was a wonderful thing. And I remember, and my, my father, who was still writing all these years, as well as producing a lot of television, uh, he used to get up very, very early in the morning and he'd be writing. And I used to stay up till very, very late at night writing. And my mother once said, you know, I heard the sound of a typewriter 24 hours a day. <laughs> Typewriting never stopped in our house on Barrington Avenue in, in Brentwood. Wow. So now, uh, I, I know from reading several of your books, the research is so deep. Can you talk about, let's start with Max Perkins. What's the process? You, you had this, you had the R&D you had done because of being at Princeton. What, what did you do in those seven years? Talk about the process. Yeah, and I, uh, I certainly had the, yes, I had some R, that is research, and I had a lot of D that I developed. I really became something and learned, I thought how to do it. But again, you know, I'm writing this book, and you ask, when did I learn to love writing? I wasn't that kid writing poetry all his life. I didn't write for the school paper. I mean, I had really written very little longer than a postcard in my life until I wrote my senior thesis, uh, which was in fact, 250 pages. So I was getting a little training there, but basically writing my book, I was getting on the job training. Now here's what goes into a biography and every biographer does it differently. I do all my research so that when I then sit down, I have it all laid out in front of me. Some people do some research on part of a life and then write it up. I don't think that system really works because what if in year six, I discover something that negates what I thought I believed uh, six years ago? That's just not gonna work. It might, or some little, some little feeling I might find even more than a fact 
might change the entire outlook of the book, the entire purpose of the book. So therefore, I like to have everything down on paper, in my head, all formulated, and then a little like Hitchcock making the movie. I mean, it's just putting film in the camera and going through the motions. I mean, it's all storyboarded. Uh, it's just getting the actors to say the words. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's the way I function. Um, there are two generally two big components of doing research on a biography. One is archival. That is, what kind of papers are there? Um, are there letters? Are there diaries? Are there manuscripts? Are there things to go through? The second part are interviews, which I like to do. Uh, because while I was in the middle of writing my first book, writing Max Perkins, I was really having a very good time. And I thought, I'm really loving this. I think I might like to do this for the rest of my life. And what I think I'd like to do is write not just a biography, but write a shelf full of biographies. Each one, each subject will be a 20th century American cultural figure. And each one of my characters, each one of my, my subjects will be from a different wedge of the American apple pie. And so, I began with Max Perkins, who was an East Coast, Harvard-educated um, king of the publishing world. And then after that, I began to build on each book, looking for different parts of the country and different segments of the body. Okay, so one question before we move on. Uh, yeah. Now that you are writing and you're, you're enjoying it, um, yeah. is it really a job because what I like to say is people say well how long have you been working in the movie business <coughs> I say I haven't worked a day in my life I love what I do do you feel the same way or do you feel like oh god it's a job uh, I well I never feel oh it's a job but I do I do feel both in that um, I show up at my office, which is to say wherever I live um, every day and sit down at, at my machine. Um, when I was writing Max Perkins, in fact, especially more when I was writing Max Perkins, because even though my parents never applied this pressure, I applied the pressure of, well, I'm, I'm not out there earning anything. Here I am able-bodied, um, not feeble-minded in my mid twenties, and I'm living at home still. So as a result of that, the rule I gave myself is I will work 27 days every month, uh, which I did usually starting. I like to be at my, my desk by nine, and then I would work in two and a half hour shifts around the clock uh, up until about one in the morning. Um, and I would do that. So I did that for about seven years, basically, while I wrote that book. Um, so that's more or less out. the way I still, yeah, it's worked out. It's, it's basically the way I still function. So to that extent, yes, it is a job. On the other hand, there's nothing I would rather be doing. And I have the perfect job for me in that I love doing research. I love doing interviews. I love writing. I love rewriting. I love copy editing. I love correcting punctuation marks. <laughs> and then... I mean, I, I mean, don't get me started on the semicolon because we don't have time. I mean, that's a good half hour I can do on the do, semicolon. Do you, ever have, do you ever have time to watch TV anymore? Um, I do. <laughs> okay. I, I, I do watch some TV. All right. So, yes. So Max Perkins, the book comes out. Yes. Uh, and it wins the National Book Award and it becomes a bestseller. I know. And you yeah. get a, a, call, a call or a letter from a man probably you didn't, maybe you had heard of, Sam Goldwyn Jr. Yep, and never met him. What happens? How, how does, what happens with that phone call or that letter? <clears throat> with that, um, it was, um, he first called my agent and then it was, would I take a phone call from him? And then we had the phone call. And the phone call was, my father, said Sam Goldwyn Jr., uh, died about five years ago. Before he died, uh, I promised him, as he wanted, as the old man wanted, to find a biographer for him. 
Um, and I also promised that I would wait until he died because my father wanted to tell the truth and we don't want to tell that story while he's alive. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I said, well, actually my first reaction was, yeah, this sounds great, but you know, I really, I'm a little more literary than that. You know, I was very grand now. Um, and he said, well, you might want to think this over a little because I have some, some papers you might want to see. And that was actually my objection because I had read a lot of Hollywood books over the years. And frankly, most of them were just terrible uh, because most of them were uh, made up uh, or there were no archives. To, you, you couldn't really write a good solid biography of any of these moguls because most of them were semi-literate at best and really left no papers. And Sam Goldwyn Jr. said to me, look, before you make a decision, uh, here's the key to a vault at Lions Moving and Storage uh, in Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard. Why don't you go and check this out first and see if it appeals to you? And I remember I drove out there uh, I went into this building. It's uh, the building's still there. It's six or seven. I think it's six, six stories high. I was then instructed to find the vault I was going to. I had, for reasons this building was built, I had to go up to the in the elevator, six flights, go outside onto the roof, cross the building, go down another set of stairs. And there, at the end of two long, dark hallways, I would find the vault. Wow. And I went in and I put the key in the padlock and turned it, and that was that. And I walked in, it was completely dark, and I felt around and found that I could barely see there was a light bulb hanging from the ceiling with a switch, so I turned it on. And I looked around in this huge room, was just surrounded by filing cabinets. And I thought, okay, let's, let's see. I want to see the first thing in here and the last thing in here. And the first thing I found in drawer one, folder one, had to do with that moment when Samuel Goldfish, as he was then named, having been born Shmuel Geldfish in Warsaw, Poland, Shmuel, uh, Samuel Goldfish was now had now talked his brother-in-law Jesse Lasky, uh, who was a vaudevillian, um, to go into the movie business, which didn't exist. Frankly, it was next to nothing. I mean, it was virtually nothing. It wasn't a business yet. There were there were movies out there, and in so doing, in getting prepared for this, he made arrangements. This is so Sam Goldwyn to meet with Thomas Edison. Because, okay, who invented movies? Thomas Edison. Well, let's go to the big man, you know? Um, and, and, and mindful of what John Goldwyn was saying to you last week, have access to the ear, the guy at the top. Well, in this instance, the guy at the top was Thomas Edison. <laughs> yeah, the light bulb, the gramophone, and motion pictures. So sure enough, I thought, ooh, that's pretty powerful. Now I circle the entire room. And now I go to the last file cabinet, pull out, open the last drawer, pull out the last folder, the last item in it is the book that Sam Goldwyn's secretary kept of every phone call that came in. Flip, flip, flip to the last page. The last phone call Samuel Goldwyn received as Samuel Goldwyn, the producer, came from Warren Beatty. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, I am now surrounded by archives, facts, papers that cover Hollywood from Thomas Edison to Warren Beatty. I've got to write this book. Wow. I've got to write this book. And I did. So I, I called up Sam Jr. and said, let's, let's, let's make a deal. Wow. And I know that you interviewed over 100 people. <laughs> And you spent, I, from what I understand, nine years writing this book. You've got it and exactly right. Spent nine years on the, the best, book. The best the, book the, ever uh, about Hollywood. So congratulations for that. Well, thank um, you. 
Uh, Billy Wilder think, was a big did you, fan of that. Did you, were you able to talk to Warren Beatty and ask him what that last conversation was? <laughs> he was just checking in, you know. Um, and 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 actually, um, Warren Beatty was very touched. In fact, that a that he held that position, and he knew Goldwyn. They were both great friends of Charlie Feldman. Uh, so that was their connection. And I have a wonderful uh, photograph in the book of Charlie Feldman's uh, wedding. His, uh, there was a wedding party and, and it's basically uh, Charlie Feldman and his new wife surrounded by 20 of the great Hollywood figures of the day. And, and Warren Beatty was the pup in that picture. And Ray Stark uh, was probably there too. Absolutely, absolutely. Well now. Uh, and there was Sam Golden, yeah. Uh, start, start out. Don't you can't give us the whole beginnings, but <clears throat> talk about, from what I understand, a man from Poland who literally walked across Europe to get yeah, to he, England and then finally get. And he, I mean, what I love is we all talk about the American dream of coming from nothing and really becoming something. Yeah, and I don't know of another. I mean, there are plenty of examples, but this is a great one to come from absolutely nothing. Uh, definitely, it is, it is the great American story. What I realized not long after getting into it was that it was also the story of his half dozen, maybe 10 other men who all entered and started the motion picture business. And in many ways, it was also the story of especially those East European Jewish immigrants who all left Eastern Europe at the same time, all came to America because they had heard about something called the American dream. I, I remember when I, when I first interviewed and then became very friendly with, with Willie Wyler, the great director, William Wyler, because he had the same journey, although several years later. But when he made it, he got to America. The first thing he asked somebody is, where's the street paved in gold? Well, this, these were the myths that existed. And Samuel Goldwyn was one of those guys. So he grew up in extreme poverty in the ghetto in Warsaw, realized life was going nowhere. His father died very young. Here's Shmuel, the eldest of the six children. At best, what is he going to do? You know, he's if if in fact he doesn't become cannon fodder for the czar, um, who is fighting wars all the time. And hey, put push the Jews up front. <laughs> you know? um, right. uh, so he, at age thirteen, ran away, basically, uh, and he did it in stages. He did walk across Europe um, um, until he got to Hamburg. Uh, and then he, he he told a wonderful story of how he cried and cried for money so that he could get to the next step of his journey. Uh, but in fact, he stole the money um, and was able to get to England, where he had some distant relatives, worked there for a little while. Um, but when he arrived in England, he didn't know a soul. He went to London. He, he lived in Hyde Park under a bench for, for several days, but finally made his way to the Midlands where he had these relatives. And then finally, again, said he begged for the money, but probably stole the money so that he could get on a boat across the ocean, um, which he did and uh, came to America. Reached New York City, uh, where again, he had no real trade uh, found his way to the Lower East Side and thought, and this was so smart of him, he realized in that moment that he was trading one Jewish ghetto for another Jewish ghetto, being on the Lower East Side of New York, where they were speaking Yiddish or German or Polish, whatever language they were. And then he went to an, uh, went to an employment agency and heard that they were looking for workers in a little town upstate New York called Gloversville. And what do you think they do in Gloversville? They make gloves, yeah, and there he was. And he went up to Gloversville and became uh, first the janitor uh, in a glove factory and then worked his way up and finally became a glove maker, learned how to stitch gloves and then 
talked his way into becoming a glove salesman because he realized that's where the money was really. Uh, and he became over the next few years, the most successful glove salesman in America, period. So I'm not sure one would be writing books about that, but he was the leader in his field. He also realized, and this shows how that brain of his was always clicking away. He realized that there were basically six glove manufacturers in this country and they had a lock on the business. And so even if he was gonna continue in the glove business, even if he was gonna start his own, and he did try starting his own glove business, he was never gonna become one of the big guys. He was never gonna become a giant. He was always gonna be a really well-paid guy with a nice life, but that would be that. And it was walking home from, um, from his office uh, to his apartment on the west side one day hot August afternoon in 1913, just to cool off in the dark, not that there was air conditioning, uh, he stopped off into a movie theater in Times Square. And as he walked into the theater for the first time, he saw a flicker, a flickering image up on a big screen. And in that instant, he saw Bronco Billy, the most popular cowboy of the day, jump onto um, or from a moving train onto a galloping horse. Well, that was the most exciting thing Sam Goldfish had ever seen. And he decided there's a business here. I want to get into it. And, and he did. He went, he went back to his brother-in-law, Jesse Pulaski, and said, we can make a fortune doing this. Let's do it. And you, Jesse, you're already in show business. And with your knowledge of that, and my, my ability to make deals and to sell, we can do something here. Wow. And that's what they did. Amazing. <clears throat> now, cl clarify for me, because I think John Goldman <laughs> got some of it right. But tell me how people always say, well, but Goldwyn wasn't part of MGM. So how come the name's Goldwyn? Can you kind of fill us in on that little? Uh... Yeah, I can. Um, Gold Goldfish still um, started this first business with Jesse Lasky and, and they, they found a property. It was a love story that was also a Western called The Squall Man. Uh, and they needed a director, obviously. And they went to hire um, a writer director named William DeMille. Uh, and they went to his agent, who was his mother. And Mrs. DeMille uh, said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, um, William is booked uh, for all, all year, but I do have another boy, Cecil, um, and maybe you could hire him, you know, because he's a very good actor, and, and yeah, he's directed, yeah, sure, you know, what he really Luck wants to do is direct. Luck yeah. and timing. How about that? And so the three of them basically formed this company. Uh, they, um, Sam Goldfish, uh, the, the the front office back east basically put Jesse Lasky and DeMille and their cast on a train and sent them to the end of the line, which happened to be Hollywood, uh, where they rented a barn and made what we now consider the first feature film ever made in Hollywood. And that was The Squaw Man, which came out in early 1914. Uh, after a couple of years of making movies, uh, they joined forces with Adolf Zukor and began what became Paramount Studios. Uh, unfortunately, what people realized, DeMille and Lasky knew it going in, Zukor realized it soon thereafter. Samuel Goldfish was the worst person you can be in business with. He had a terrible temper. He listened to nobody. He wanted to be in charge of everything, even things he knew nothing about, which was a lot of things. And so basically, uh, Zukor said one day uh, to Jesse and Cecil, you got to make a choice. You either stay in business with me or you go with Goldfish, but I, you can't have both. Because, and they sided with Zukor. And so here Sam Goldwyn gets kicked out of the company he literally starts by his brother-in-law and by Cecil DeMille, whom he also brought into the business. So they're gone, Paramount goes on to become Paramount. And that's that. Now here's 
Sam Goldfish scrambling, looking for a new partners or a new business. He goes into business with two theatrical brothers uh, who are very successful on Broadway, named the Selwyns, Archie and Edgar. And they form a company and they're very successful. They begin making a lot of movies. Wouldn't you know, Selwyns are having a little trouble <laughs> with, with Goldfish. Um, but they put together, the one great thing that came out of this partnership is they put together their last names, Selwyn and Goldfish, and they started Goldwyn Pictures. Uh, it was, as the joke goes, either that or Selfish Productions, uh, which was more apt, but they went with the very euphonious Goldwyn Pictures. And now Goldwyn or Goldfish goes to court to keep the name. He rather likes that name Goldwyn because everybody makes fun of Goldfish. And he actually wins the case in court that he could use that as his legal name from there on. So Sam Goldwyn now is born, but he has no company. He's been bought out because, you know, even though they've been making great, successful and qualitative movies, and now Louis B. Mayer and Metro, Metro Pictures, they're, they're all getting together and they're putting together a big, bigger company. They're trying to expand. Uh, let's pick up today's newspaper. It's all about expansion. Uh, and they decide, that is uh, mostly Louis B. Mayer and Lowe's, uh, that they should merge with the Goldwyn Company uh, because that means quality pictures. And gee, we sort of like their logo too, that roaring lion. That's pretty good. Um, so yes, MGM was formed. And the short answer to your question is no, Samuel Goldwyn never belonged to MGM. By the time the merger happened in 23, 1924, Goldwyn was years out of that company. So that wow. was that. Wow. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> for anybody who wants to know anything about Hollywood, Find Scott Berg and take him. Away. <laughs> I got to tell you, yeah. Now you, you, you. As I know, you you interviewed at least a hundred people. Were they easy to get to? If you said, "Hey, I'm doing a thing on Sam Goldwyn," and they go, "Sam Goldwyn, I hated that son of a blah blah blah," or uh, how how did you how did you get to everybody? I mean, starting well, with I don't know, was Mabel Norman or uh, yeah, Mabel, was, May McAvoy? Well, I never got to Mabel Norman. Sweet, I did get to Blanche, yes, Blanche Sweet, May McAvoy, uh, Madge Kennedy. Uh, I mean, these were huge, huge silent screen stars. But uh, I, I thought you were answering your own question. Did they all say Sam Goldwyn, that son of a whatever? Yes, I want to talk to you about him. <laughs> because I want you to hear my Goldwyn story. Because if you think you've heard about <laughs> monsters in Hollywood, wait till you hear me my Sam Goldwyn story. I began actually, well, here's what I did. This was something I learned when I did my Perkins book also. So I'm now on book two, which is I made a list of all the people I wanted to see. And I think there were about 150. And I put them in order of age and anything I might've heard about their health. Um, you know, let's get real here. Um, and uh, then I would kind of work down the list. Uh, but I did begin uh, wisely uh, with somebody who, who was in his 80s, wasn't all that healthy, um, and was just beginning to go a bit, um, and was really so vital to the story. And that was the great director, George Cukor, who had been the great love of Francis Goldwyn's life. Um, and and vice versa. Uh, and I went to him uh, and he was, he was, and that was set up because he had remained very friendly with the Goldwyn family. That was one call from Sam Jr. to George Cougar saying, will you meet this guy? He's the one we have anointed to write the book. And he gladly did it. And he was a wonderful source. I, I went back to that well many times, but now I've got George Cukor in my pocket who would say to me, oh, you should really talk to Madge Kennedy, you know, um, who was one of his first silent screen stars. And 
and here's where she lives. Here's her address and um, here's her phone number even. So I wrote, so I began writing letters as I always did. And I always sent people a copy of my first book, which was somewhat decorated. And so people realized I wasn't just doing a trashy Hollywood tell all book. I was trying to do a serious study of what that industry was, what that art form was, and who these people were. And I don't just mean the movie stars, but I mean the prop man. I mean, you know, I spent one of the most interesting days of my life with, with Irving Sindler, Samuel Goldman's prop man for 50 years. He was as interesting as, as the sound man, as Danny Mandel, the, the, uh, the film editor. I mean, these people were giants in their fields. Well, but and certainly, that, sorry, Henry, but that's that's what the Motion Picture and Television Fund is all about. It's all about we are all one family, and, and I, uh, yep. you got it. You you got you got a chance to do that. Well, I I had a sense of that growing up, but when I began talking to all these people, and I saw just what you were saying, Hawk, which is how everybody, you know, making a movie or the industry itself, it's one giant wheel with a thousand cogs. And no, I mean, you may say one cog is more important than the other, but the wheel doesn't move unless all the cogs are, are working. So that, I, I wish, that was the case for me. I wish some but, studio, studio heads and independent financers would understand that, but that's for another, yeah. that's for another day. But tell well, me, that is. I, I know I know you learned about the fun through the gold ones, but I understand there was a story when you were a kid how you found out about the fun. Actually, I learned about the fun before the gold ones, long before, as you just um, suggested. And that is I do my research. Yes, clearly, clearly. Um, in 1961, I think it was 1962, my father had was morphing from being a television writer to be being a producer and he was uh, producing a, a show called Checkmate which was very popular in the early 60s it was a detective agency um, set in San Francisco uh, and um, and my father was well my father rather like Sam Goldman although a lot nicer I might add uh, was a super salesman uh, and he always believed in casting and so here he was doing a rather uh, routine detective one hour series, but he populated movie stars every week into this show somehow. And there was one episode, he had it in his head that the pretty much then retired Mary Astor should be in it. Uh, you know, I mean, whether he had seen Maltese Falcon too many right. times, I don't know. With the bird or not. <laughs> exactly. But that was the only one he, well, no, unfortunately, Mary's not acting anymore, blah, blah, blah. Where is she? And anyway, my father learned she was out at, quote, the home. And my father went out there and found Mary Astor. And I remember he came home and he talked about this place that has come to our home from that home and talked about how fantastic it was. And as he pointed out, Mary Astor, first of all, was not ancient. She was in her 50s, I think. She was not indigent. She was not ill. She wanted to, to live out there at that time. It was just a wonderful place in a community of people she adored. Wow. She later moved out, but then ended up moving back um, and spent her final years out there in, in Woodland Hills. But I remember thinking, wow, what a place. And I, I just remember the enthusiasm with which my father talked about that. Then when I was into, actually maybe it was while I was finishing, yes, I was fi finishing Max Perkins before I was into, um, into Goldwyn, I had become friendly with Roddy McDowell. Uh, and at this point also, I'm now in the Goldwyn book and I had met Kevin McCormick, um, whom I moved in with and now we are married, but uh, Kevin, uh, who's also extremely involved in the MPTF. Uh, but anyway, Roddy uh, took a real shine to us and used to invite us to MPTF events and talked about this place. 
Now, Roddy, you know, Roddy was a magical creature, both in Hollywood for the MPTF and just on the planet Earth. Um, but nobody, let me repeat that, nobody knew more Hollywood people or cared more about Hollywood people than Roddy McDowell, who made a point when he first came to Hollywood, and I think he was 13 or so, when he first came out here, he made a point of relating to all the older people. I mean, he became a great friend of, of Lillian Gish and of Mary Pickford and, and to say nothing of people, his, his contemporaries and anyone in between those ages, you know, between being a teenage boy um, and being an old timer. And yeah, no, so I, uh... he befriended them. Everybody knew Roddy. Uh, yeah. Kevin I and I, I, I got to meet him. I got well, to meet he was him. A, I got to meet him through total Natalie pleasure. Wood. He was a good yeah. friend of Natalie Woods. I got to extremely meet. good. He was an extremely good friend of everybody's. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so, I, mean, I mean, and legendary friendships, legendary friendships. But of course, with the MGM kids, I'm Elizabeth Taylor, you know, with whom he grew up in real life and on film. Um, so his whole life and his all his friendships are basically recorded on film, but he no, I, loved the MPTF because they took care of his family. You know, going back to uh, to uh, Goldwyn for a minute. Um, yeah, I know you interviewed all these people, three of whom I actually got to work with later Tell in their who. careers. Who, who. So uh, I got to work with Myrna Loy. Nice. I got to work with Sir Lawrence Olivier on a movie called Marathon Man. Yeah, and I right. got to work with John Huston on Chinatown. Uh, the Myrna Loy movie was a film called The April Fools. It's yes, Jack Lemmon and Jack Deneuve. Yep. yep. And so I, is there a story with a, uh, you meeting any of those three that you can kind of espoused as something that blew you away. I mean, Myrna Loy, oh my God. <laughs> she, she was such a pro in 1968 doing the April Fools. And of course, Houston, the story of, for us on Chinatown is the reason why we did so many takes of that last shot was because Houston was so drunk that he kept blowing. I mean, it's all one shot if you remember. I do it. remember very well. But uh, at the end, he so apologized to us, to the whole crew. He was quite wonderful. Sorry. Hey, no, but even an apology from John Houston is better than anything from anybody else. You know, <laughs> come on. I, just, I mean, how did you can tell a story about one of those three? I don't. Care. Well, I don't know where to begin because they they were all really integral figures in in Goldwyn's life in one way or another. Myrna Loy. Um, was in, not even arguably, uh, Sam Goldwyn's greatest movie, which is Best Years of Our Lives, uh, which was a movie I, I knew cold. Um, of course, I mean, the great thing about meeting Myrna Loy is she was Myrna Loy. I mean, when you met her off duty, she's still Myrna Loy. <laughs> she's, she's everything you wanted Myrna Loy to be. Um, and, and I remember there's one, just one where there are a dozen incredible iconic moments in that film. But for me, I have only to see these 35 seconds and I break down in tears every time. And that is the moment Frederick March comes home from the war, rings the doorbell at the apartment and, and the, the two children answer the door and down the long hall and in the kitchen is Myrna Loy. Uh, and I remember Willie Wyler had told me he had staged it exactly the way it was, what it was like for him when he first saw his wife after coming home from the war. In any case, um, this moment uh, happens and the two of them approach each other. And it was the homecoming of every father in America. And there it was. So I wanted, I really wanted to parse that scene in my book. So I remember saying, I, I asked her to talk about that moment. I said, you know, so, so what was your thinking? What was your motivation in that moment? 
she said, well, all I could think of is, I want to get this guy in the sack because I haven't had anybody in my bed for, for three years. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm never going to look at that scene the same again. But, but I then did look at it. And sure enough, it's, it's it, in her eyes. It was right there. <laughs> That's pretty and she, pretty also, cool. you, and she also has had a lovely reaction. She also said, you know, I think what that scene was about for me, because as the doorbell rings and there's no response, who is it? And she yells out to the kids, who is it, Rob? Who is it? And nobody speaks. And she realizes who it is. And she said, I think for me, what physically the scene was about was my shoulders because the camera's to her back. And she said, uh, she was making dinner, putting the dishes away. She said, and suddenly my shoulders dropped. And I realized he's home. Wow. And then I got to get him in the sack. And, and whoosh, down the hall they come. So that was, that was a Myrna Loy story. That, that's, the, we got so, I wish we had time for, <laughs> you're going to have to come back three or four times, Scott. I, I want to, I just want to say that for me, I cried in a lot of Goldwyn movies. For me, it was Pride of the Yankees. I consider myself, consider myself, you know, but yeah. from what I understand, you know, Goldwyn, uh, his, his movies were nominated seven times for Oscars, but he yeah. only won, or they, the movies only won one, which was Best yeah. Years of Our Lives. Yeah. Was that a, uh, was, was he, everything he wanted, he so wanted to win that Oscar. Talk about it the was it was the happiest moment of his life, and in many ways, it was the saddest moment of his life. Uh, and that very night, uh, Sam and his wife Frances went home, went back to the house on Laurel Lane in, in Beverly Hills, behind the Beverly Hills Hotel. And Frances goes up to bed, and she realizes Sam hasn't come up. He's, and so she goes downstairs and she finds him sitting on a couch in the dark, holding his Oscar and his Thalberg Award, which he won that night also, crying his eyes out. Because now, where do you go? Where do you go? Wow. And as Sam Goldman used to say, you're only as good as your next picture. Yeah. I, I was just on a, on a Producers Guild call before this, <laughs> still talking to trying to figure out some strategies for producers with streaming and everything. And all we were talking about is, I don't care who you are, if you're Jason Blum or you're Chuck Roven or whoever it is, it's only what's the next picture. Yeah. It's not, I don't care what you've done for me lately and it's never- yeah, what, what can you do for me now? Yeah. Uh, so because we don't, we're, we're gonna run out of time and I wanna get to Catherine Hepburn, I just wanna okay. say that that, Lynn, that, that after, after Goldwyn, and of course Goldwyn became a bestseller, then you do Lindbergh. Uh, just tell us the story, because I love the story. And by the way, the Lindbergh, you won the Pulitzer Prize. So, yes. but, but tell us the story of how you, I think, went to Florida, because nobody would, he, she would never give, uh, his widow oh, would never give away his stuff. Wow, uh, yes. Um, well, basically, uh, Charles Lindbergh died leaving a widow, a legend in her own right, and Morrow Lindbergh, one of the great writers and certainly one of the greatest diarists of the 20th century. Um, God, and lived just an amazing story because with the exception of that first flight from New York to Paris, Anne Morrow Lindbergh was usually his co-pilot and navigator. So she was making some of these incredible flights as well. But in any case, I decided having written about Perkins East Coast um, uh, publishing, Sam Goldwyn now, West Coast, East European Jewish immigrant, Hollywood, I wanted to write about a Midwestern figure. And I began to think, what are, what are the metaphors for 20th century America, the way the movie camera is? Um, and I thought the airplane, who's the great embodiment of the airplane? Who's a romantic figure? Who hasn't really been written about very well? Charles Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh. Well, I found out the reason he hadn't been written about well is that all his archives, which I had heard were voluminous, rooms full of material, um, were locked up. Not only locked up, 
but that nobody could see them for 50 years after Anne Marl Lindbergh dies. And here she was alive and well. So this was looking like it wasn't gonna happen in my lifetime. But I did hear by talking to a librarian at Yale where those papers were, that there was a strange asterisk in the will that said, if Anne Morrow Lindbergh or three of the five children choose somebody, they could have access to the papers. Ah, well, where there's a will, there's a way. Now we have a way in. Now I have a job in front of me because I really wanted to do this book. And so I began writing letters to Anne Morrow Lindbergh, hearing nothing back. I mean, I would send letters every two months, didn't hear anything. I gave myself a year. After about 11 months, I got a letter not from her, but from one of the children, from Reeve Lindbergh, also a wonderful writer, uh, who said, Mother's been getting a lot of mail from you. Would you like to meet her? Because we think it's time somebody wrote a book about father. And I said, yes, I would love to meet her. Yeah, when, where, where do I go? Well, mother goes to Fort Myers Beach every winter and stays in a, in a condo um, with a friend, uh, well, with Charles's best friend, basically, uh, basically, I mean, he was a realtor. He set her up in an apartment. Um, so they're, they are gonna be gathered. If you can get there next week, we will have an apartment for you and you can come over for all the meals um, and you can meet mother, you'll meet best friend, best friend's wife, and you'll meet the daughter Reeve uh, and mother's sister. So for the next seven days, every breakfast, lunch or dinner was some permutation or combination of those, those five people. And I'm singing and dancing my little heart out, you know, I'm, I'm just, Saying whatever it is I can say or do. Not just Sam, then, Gold, not just Sam Goldwyn or your father. You became a pretty good salesman too. Hey, well, I was I was doing my best, you know. Fortunately, I was still young, so I could I could um, I don't know what, but uh, I could I could be dumb, dumb enough to persevere. And after seven days of this, I just said, I'm kind of talked out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got nothing left to say. And so we all said goodbye. And I, you know, had to go to the airport. And as I was getting into my car to go to the airport um, in Fort Myers, Florida, to fly, I thought to LA, fly home, figuring I hadn't done anything, hadn't pulled it off. And Marl Lindbergh came running out to my car and handed me a letter. Um, a blue envelope. And she said, here, read this. And I opened it up and it was the legal permission to have access to all the papers. She had called her lawyer that morning who dictated a letter. She hand wrote it. She said, well, all of Charles's uh, papers are at Yale. Uh, so why don't you uh, go up there and show them this letter? Be very careful with the letter. She said, nobody's ever seen one of these. Um, I said, yeah. And so I changed my, my ticket, flew to New York, and then went up to New Haven, Connecticut, went to the librarian, showed her the letter. And she said, where did you get this? You know, I said, it's from Mrs. Lindbergh. And Is it framed said, on the wall behind you? It's in my desk. Some, it's right, it's somewhere in, in this desk, one foot from me. It's never farther than 18 inches wow, from me. what a story. Um, and anyway, it, it, was, it was the key to um, about 1,400 boxes of papers. And about two weeks later, I got another letter in the mail, another blue envelope from Anne Marl Lindbergh. I thought, oh, she's taking it all back. And it was, it occurs to me, you can't write about Charles without writing about me. So here's the letter to see all my papers, which are at Smith College. Uh, so that was another 600 boxes. So basically, I had about 2000 boxes to get through to say nothing of again, dozens, scores, hundreds of people to talk to. And you, won the Pulitzer. and you won the Pulitzer Prize for that too. So that was a very nice day. That was a very nice day. That was a very yeah. happy day. Yeah. yeah, so you're in the big time. I mean, you're meeting <laughs> and having lunches and dinners with the hoi polloi of the world. How do you keep your ego from inflating? Um, 
I'm a good ox. That's that's what I do. I'm I um, when people ask me how do you write a biography, you you basically plow the field. You just like a good ox, go all the way up, turn around, come all the way back, turn around, go all the way up. I still work my seven days a week. I just just keep your head down. Uh, the books really don't get any easier. There's always another challenge. Um, and so, you know, I just keep at it, keep doing what I'm doing. So, so. now you, 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 you win that, you, you, you win yeah. the Pulitzer and you've been friends, I guess I, I read that you were friends with Catherine Hepburn for 20 years. Um, I, I was. I, I don't I, know if you remember, I don't know if you heard, uh, <clears throat> Robert Benton was on my program a few weeks ago. And oh, he, no, I missed him. I love him. He went in, he was in a small theater at late at night in New York City on the west side, on the east side. And uh, he went to see A Place in the Sun for like the 50th time or whatever, because he loved it. And when the lights came up, there were only two people in the theater, somebody he didn't know and Catherine Hepburn. Oh my gosh. And he just went, it was unbelievable. So she's always been my favorite actress. And I just, I mean, there isn't anything I don't love of hers. And I just heard the other day, I didn't know this, that after bringing up baby for two years, she was persona non grata. Nobody wanted to work with her. They, it got bad reviews. I mean, it was a Howard Hawks, wonderful slapstick, ridiculous comedy. And Talk, can you talk about talk about your relationship with her and sure and you are correct she was out of the business she was box office poison and I remember and I'll just jump ahead for a little to say you know box office poison I mean sticks and stones may break my bones she said no 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 no, no. there were posters in Hollywood that said these actresses are box office poison. Do not make films with them. And the big studios were not. And, and Garbo was on that list also. They just weren't pulling them into the theaters anymore. So that was, so it was a very real thing, which led to, well, really one of the great Hollywood career stories, which I'll tell you in a second. I met her because in 1982, Esquire magazine was on the verge of celebrating its 50th anniversary. And they wanted to do a very grand 50th anniversary issue for which they were going to 50 writers, asking each of them to pick somebody in the last 50 years who has, quote, made a difference in American life. And they knew I was writing a Goldwyn book and they figured I would pick one of the moguls and write about maybe Goldwyn, maybe Mayer, who may, maybe Selznick. Um, and I said, I've got a great idea. I want to write about Catherine Hepburn. Because like you, like Robert Benton, like, like Warren Beatty, who told me that, um, she, you know, she was the greatest. She was funny. She was smart. She was beautiful. She, you know, and for women, she really redefined the modern American woman. Uh, from the way they dress well. to the way they talk to the way they have careers, all that. So she's the whole package. Great. Easy sell, I thought. Editor of Esquire said, oh, uh, two things. Uh, no, we're not interested in Catherine Hepburn. You're not interested because we don't want to do any Hollywood people and we don't really want to do any women. Now, this is 1982. Wow. I said, first of all, and I'm not talking to two or three editors there. I said, guys, you got a big problem. If you don't see the importance of Hollywood in the last 50 years, uh, I, I'm afraid you've been sleeping under a rock. But second of all, it's 1982, and you're going to focus on the 50 most significant people in the last half century, and you have no women? You don't even have Eleanor Roosevelt in there? I said, guys, not only don't I want to write for this issue, I don't even want to read it. It sounds ridiculous. And they said, well, we'll think about it. And I came back a week later and re-pitched it. And I said, how about this? How about you do 49 guys and one woman, Catherine Hepburn, and she will speak for all womankind in the last 50 years. Yeah, we're not getting it, we're not getting it. And I said, 
let me try it this way. What if I said I wanted to write about Spencer Tracy? Oh, we love that. That's fantastic. Spencer Tracy. Do, I said, you, you know what interests me most about Spencer Tracy? That relationship he had with Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I said, well, I got a better idea. What about Bogart? Uh, and they said, yeah, Bogey, that's who we're looking at. I said, you know, Bogey made 50 movies. Do you know he won one Academy Award? Do you know who the leading lady was? That would have been Catherine Hepburn in The African Queen, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, about, what about Jimmy Stewart? I said, yeah, he's the American, all-American guy. He's, the, he's, you know, Mr. America. Yeah, I said, you know, Jimmy... 60 movies, one Academy Award. That was for a Philadelphia story. That was uh, Catherine Hepburn, wasn't it? Yeah, right. What about Henry Fonda? Um, 60 years of movies, one Oscar. That was uh, on Golden Pond, wasn't it? Let's do Catherine Hepburn. Okay, now I have to meet her. So I, I didn't know Catherine Hepburn. I didn't know anybody who knew Catherine Hepburn, really. George Cukor knew her. Um, uh, so, um, I wrote a letter, didn't hear anything back. And then about a month later, my phone rang and I swear the phone rang differently than it ever had. It, it had a little shake to it or something. And then the voice came on and said, do you think this is a good idea? And I said, who is this? You know who this is. This is Kate Hepburn. Now, do you think this is a good idea? And I said, uh, yeah. What's the idea again? This article. Anyway, uh, we started talking about what the article is. She's, and she hated that magazine, she, all the things. Anyway, I said, look, they've told me they're going to do 49 men. You're going to be the only representative of Hollywood, the only woman. I think it'd be great. I think it'd be fun. And I said, and you know what? I wanted to meet you. So. Uh, all my cards are on the table now. So she said, okay, next time you're in New York, uh, let's meet. So I was in New York two days later. <laughs> I just happened to be in New York. And we, uh, and we met and, um, and decided uh, we'd do it. We proceeded. We spent uh, two solid days together. That was a Wednesday and a Thursday. And then at the end of it, and we're having a drink at the end of the day, she said, what are you doing for the weekend? And I said, uh, I don't know. She said, well, I go up to Connecticut every Friday midday. Why don't you come up for the weekend? And I thought, oh, house parties in Connecticut, this could be fun. Um, and I said, listen, I have an interview that day, midday, that I'll get there on my own steam. I'll drive up there. I was interviewing Blank Sweet, I remember, that very day. <laughs> Silent screen goddess. Anyway, I drove up. I arrived at uh, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. You cross a, 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 a bridge, and then you're in a little area uh, called Fenwick, which is kind of a, it's not really an island, but it's all, all but a private island with a golf course and tennis courts. And there at the end of Fenwick is this magnificent house overlooking Long Island Sound. And I walk in, it's about 5.30 in the afternoon. It's cold, it's, it's, it's gray. Um, the house is dark, uh, but the front door is open, but I just kind of walk in, nobody around. Uh, I couldn't have gotten it this wrong. I'm sure I'm in the right house. And then I look out in the water and there's Catherine Hepburn's head bobbing in the water. And she starts waving at me, you know, come on in, take a swim. Uh, no, no, it's okay. It's, it's, I mean, it's really cold out. It was like 40 out. You know? <laughs> and it wasn't quite raining, not quite snowing. It was kind of, but anyway, no, come on. You know, I said, no, no, no it's, it's not this. And, and I went over and I just felt the water, which was practically freezing. Anyway, she then comes out and she said, well, all right then, if you're not, you know. And, um, I then did actually, when she came and dried off, I did change into a bathing suit that she had laid out on the bed in my bedroom. And I just ran out there. I was in the water for about two seconds before I was just paralyzed with, you know, and then I just ran back. But 
But she, dared, she dared you to go in. Huh? Dared, insisted, basically. I mean, it was like, oh, you're not, you're not a player, really. So I, I did it. But anyway, when I came back in, she said, well, you've earned your drink. So now we sat by the fire, had a scotch. So for the next, for the weekend, I'm the only one there. I mean, that's it. I mean, there's the woman who, who cooks, but that is it. Uh, and we made the rounds, we drove around. I met her sister who lived down the street and this and that, we met some friends up there. And now it's Sunday afternoon. She said, I'm going back to the city. Uh, I'll give you a lift and oh, you might as well stay for dinner. So Sunday dinner, I'm now staying. Um, then she said, what are you doing tomorrow for dinner? <sighs> Next Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, I'm having dinner there. Now it's Thursday night again. And she said, what are you doing for the weekend? And I said, uh, Kate, look, this is great. This is the time of my life, but I gotta be honest with you. Um, I have a, a job, I'm writing this book on Sam Goldman. I have a mortgage back in Los Angeles. Now my parents haven't thrown me out of the house, thank you. Um, I've got to go home and, and, and get to work. And she then said, oh yes, I understand. And she's now walking me to the front door. Uh, and she said, but you come to New York a lot. I said, yeah. She said, you need a place to stay. Here's the key to the house. Let us know by by four if we're making dinner for you. Um, and that was that. And for the next 20 years, if ever I was in New York for one day or for a month, that's where I lived upstairs on the third floor. Um, or um, if she was, if it was a weekend, she'd be up in Connecticut. The um, two years I lived in New Haven, Connecticut, researching the Lindbergh, going through the Lindbergh papers, that was about a half hour from where she lived. So every weekend, um, I'd get on a five o'clock train from the library and go up and spend another weekend with her. I mean, and that's when we really became very, very close. You know, just having that week in, week out uh, relationship with her. And it was uh, just one of the happiest things to happen in my entire life. Uh, I would have... I wish I was a fly on the wall all those times. Um, well, that's what the book is. The book is being a fly on the wall because yeah. from the moment she met me, she said, you should write a book about me. And I said, really? She said, yes, because I'm fascinating. And I said, <sighs> yeah, yes, you are fascinating, but I've got to write this other book first. Well, but you should be getting my stories down. And I remember the very first night that after that first swim in Long Island Sound, when we're sitting by the fire, we had dinner, we drank scotch that night, as was her favorite drink. And we stayed up until about midnight, but from about nine until 12, she said, you know, the one thing we didn't talk about when you interviewed me in the city, we really didn't get into the story about Spence. I said, well, I wanted to be careful. I, I know it's very private. And she said, well, let me tell you the story. And between nine and midnight, she took me from the day they met on the MGM lot until the day after, two days after he died and was buried. And how she didn't go to the church service because everybody was gonna be there, but she drove her car just outside the church. Once she saw that it was taking place, turned around, drove home. That was it, that was the end. But 20 years of their relationship, I heard that night. I went to bed, I went upstairs. She showed me to my bedroom, scribble, 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 everything I could possibly, but I was, I was about, five seconds into that when the door to my bedroom swung open and she looked at me sitting there writing and she said you've got a good memory too right and I said yeah she said okay because clearly she was saying I'm never telling that story again and she never did wow she never did oh, I, I so, remember in the book 
you told a great story of Michael Jackson showing up at uh, his yeah. house for a cocktail party. Can you tell us about that night? Well, it was, it was actually, that was showing up, actually that was showing up for, because she didn't, Hepburn did not really give parties. Um, you, you would be invited to dinner. You'd be invited to drink uh, for a drink. And then uh, maybe you'd be invited to dinner. But she had become friendly. Yeah, she'd become friendly with Michael Jackson while shooting on Golden Pond. Because Jane Fonda was a friend of Michael Jackson. Jane Fonda invited Michael up to New Hampshire where they were shooting the movie. And wouldn't you know, Michael Jackson shows up and Jane Fonda's not there. She took off that weekend. And now Catherine Hepburn sees this creature wandering around all by himself. Clueless had clearly never been in the woods in his life. Um, and Hepburn you know, sort of says, who are you? And what are you doing here? And she felt such pity for this kid. Um, and he was so adorable and he, he knew who she was because uh, he was a movie freak, sort of, uh, sort of. Uh, but in any case, now cut to years later, uh, 10 years later, uh, Hepburn and I are up in Old Sabre, Connecticut. The phone rings up there. I'm, uh, she has me pulling weeds over the weekend whenever I was up there. That was my job because that's all I was good for basically. Um, and she came out, um, looked over my basket to see if I pulled enough weeds yet. And she said, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> And I said, what? She said, dinner. Guess who's coming to dinner? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said, Michael Jackson. That's who. And, it wasn't Sidney Poitier. And she, and she said, you are coming to dinner. You're going to be there. Because um, she said, there's no way I'm doing this alone. So, then, so she populated it with two or three other people. Um, and son of a gun, Michael Jackson shows up. Um, and it was, I mean, he was there, that was at six o'clock. Um, and we went until about nine. Uh, and it was surreal. I mean, it was, the Martians had invaded. I mean, this was truly having dinner with a man from another planet. And he couldn't have been sweeter he couldn't have been more adorable or more clueless. It was, it was sort of sad. Um, and then it took a very strange turn at the end when he was leaving and he asked Hepburn if they could talk privately. So she got up from her chair and went into another room and the three of us still in the room where, he'd had, where we had dinner, we just hear this yelling going on. Yeah. No, 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 no way, Michael. There's no way. And the next thing we knew, Michael Jackson was down the stairs, out on the street and gone. That was that. Hepper now comes into it. What was that about? Well, he asked me if I could arrange an appointment between him and Garbo, because that's really why he came to dinner tonight, <laughs> because he wanted to meet Garbo. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's real smart to ask one star. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. To ask one recluse of another. Yeah. Right. Not a good idea. Yeah. yeah. What did she? What did she love about acting? What did she love about acting? I think she. I think she loved almost everything about it. Um, first of all, she was a bigger than life personality. I mean, whatever you think she was from the screen, she was in reality 10% more, except that she didn't, you know, she didn't play the, the diva. She never, at home, often she never played the grand dom. Ever, ever, ever did I see that. Um, but she loved, you know, she, she knew she had real charm and, and she knew she could make it pay and she loved the art of it. She was very well read. She really knew her theater. She knew all the classics. She was proudest of her performance in Long Day's Journey. Uh, you know, that's, 
that's for my money anyway, and I know for her money, the greatest role written for a woman anyway in the American canon. Um, I mean, it's and she just killed it when she when she made the movie uh, with Ralph Richardson. Um, so she loved that. She she loved fame, and not that she necessarily worked it. And she there was strangely. I don't want to say she was shy, but there, there was a kind of modesty to her that she didn't try to milk it really. And she, I think, realized early on that the way she could really make herself unique was by pulling back a lot, which she did by becoming something of a recluse, by never showing up at the Oscars, even though you've won four of them, which nobody has as an actor. Um, you know, and she really only showed up one time. She unannounced. She popped in to present an award to Lawrence Weingarten, and then she was off the stage, and that was that. Never did the Hollywood parties really. She just wasn't into the scene. So I think she liked that it gave her um, a comfortable life that allowed her to be a genuine artist. And because she became a star so early, and sustained that for sixty years with the one blip that you referred to when she became box office poison, I think she really got off on her stature. She liked that. She liked being Catherine Hepburn. And who wouldn't, you know, it was a good thing to be. Um, I think my question is, um, shoot, wait a minute, I just <laughs> lost it. Uh, me, I'm, I'm usually right on top of it. Um, well, is it about Hepburn? Yeah, oh no, it's definitely about Hepburn. Uh, well, I can't find it, so uh, I'll have to move on. Um, but, jeez. Oh, I know well, I, the question. Yeah. Did yeah. she get to read the book before she passed away? She did not. And did she, she read any of it? Nothing, quite deliberately. Because there was, there was one condition to this whole thing, and that was, well, she said, she told me two things. One was some advice, one was a condition. The advice was, you should publish whatever you write about me as close to my death as possible. That was item one. Item two was, I want nothing published while I'm alive. And so I'm making my notes and all that. Um, and I was there for 20 years not as her biographer, not as a friend, or but as a friend. I was not there to be, to take notes. I was there to spend time with her. I adored her. She clearly enjoyed being with me. So that was great. And there were really, at that point, also very few people, almost nobody left in her life. Most of them had all died. And she, you know, this is a woman who slammed the door in people's faces for her entire career, you know, opened it two or three times in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that was that. So I never wanted her to even think that I might publish something about her while she was alive. So I just took my notes and that was that. Um, when I finished Lindbergh, my publisher said, what do you want to write? Whom do you want to write about now? Um, and I said, well, Woodrow Wilson. And that's when I began that book. And my publisher said, look, I know you don't really talk about this, but I know you go off on weekends and trips and so forth with Catherine Hepburn. Would you ever write a book about her? I said, well, it's funny. If you don't discuss this, I'll tell you. I've, I've been taking notes and roughing some, a book out, uh, but I can't publish anything while she's alive. And my editor said, my publisher said, but she said, you can't publish anything. Why don't you write the book? We, you and I will be the only two people who know about it. We will then lock it up. And then when she dies, we'll be all ready to go. And that's just what we did. Catherine Hepburn died in uh, June of 2003. And two weeks later, the book was published. Wow. And that's the moment I realized, well, I think this is the reason she said to me, publish it as close to my death as possible. I had long thought that it was so that her version was out there first, but I think it was her gift to me because she knew it would become a huge seller, which it did. And it was, you've been here for me for 20 years. 
I'm going to be there for you now. And it was, I mean, when it came out, it was a phenomenon. Yeah. I it think just I was. It and that was year. because she was a phenomenon. Yeah. And everyone wanted a memento. Yeah. And that's what the book became. And, and so I tried to do what you were suggesting, being a fly on the wall, um, listening in to 20 years of conversations, usually, usually after dinner, when she told me the story of her life. What do you think? I had a question from somebody. Uh, I think it was from uh, Freda. I think she asked the question, with email today, people don't write archives like they did. Uh, now, I know Thurg Thurgood Marshall it wasn't around for emails. Yeah. Um, so uh, can you tell us, you know, how do you think you would do it today if you were going to do somebody more contemporary? Well, this is a this is a real problem. And whenever biographers get together and periodically we leave our little caves and see each other, um, this is the first thing we talk about is where are the archives? Are, are we going to be collecting uh, people's tweets um and hard whenever, drives. <laughs> and yeah hard drives and i always tell people please print out anything in your machines mm. uh and uh you know when i wrote my max perkins book i i benefited from the fact that because it was all about literature and all these great writers but even then you see uh perkins was very hard of hearing so he did almost no business on the phone now most writers today just call up their editor if they have a problem or a question. Perkins did almost none of that. So everything was written in a letter. So I had just, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters that I could work with. Today, it's a tough thing and well, it is that, going to be a problem. That's what I was going to say with book publishing today. How has it changed since you started? The it's, it's changed in, in many ways. That's that's among the least of the reasons. The, the biggest change now is and this is analogous to Hollywood too. Um, there are now basically four publishers in the entire world. I mean, four mega companies own every publishing house. And you have only to pick up the newspaper on any given day to see which network or which studio is absorbing the other right now. And you'll find that they are in fact all part of a bigger conglomerate that's in fact some international operation somewhere. and. So that is a huge change um, in terms of what is getting published. Um, I, uh, when I talk to literary groups, uh, I explain that when I wrote my first book, when I was in my 20s writing about Max Perkins and writing about Max Perkins, I was writing about the literary world. Today, it's the book business and it's bigger than a business. It's the book conglomerates. And and that is a huge difference. It, everyone is in pursuit of the great bestseller. Um, and, and that's it, the way, the way studios thrive on the, on the big blockbuster yeah, that no, you I really just, need. Yeah, it's just, you, need, you need a big opening weekend now. That's the same in the book business uh, right now. There's no time to build either with a single book or to build a career. Um, you know, Perkins worked with a writer named Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, who wrote a couple of nice books, but none of them was a big seller. And then one day he said, you know, Marjorie, I have an idea for you. Why don't you write a book about a, about a young boy raising an animal in the Florida scrub country, you know? And she writes back, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call it the fawn. And well, yeah, what about the yearling, you know? <laughs> and then the next thing you know, there's, there's the yearling winning the Pulitzer Prize, becoming the biggest seller of 1938 um, and so forth. So that's very hard to happen today. If a publishing house signs a writer today, it's because that first book smells like a big hit. Um, well, it's hard to say I'm investing give? in your fourth book. What advice would you give a young writer who wants to be a biographer today, what would you tell them? Um, wait till I'm gone so I have less competition. Um, um, or in reality, I say, uh, don't take anybody's advice because if you really want to start a biography now, and I would even say this to a novelist too, um, if you need somebody to tell you you've got to do it, I'm not sure you're going to be able to make it through. Um, 
there was nothing that was going to stop me from writing my first book. Again, I was abetted in a big way by my, by my parents, um, but nothing was going to stop me. And I remember thinking, and, and my, parent, my parents didn't tell me this until the book came out and was a success because um, nobody expected it to be a bestseller. <clears throat> but my parents used to, my mother told me that for years, she and my father used to say to each other, we hear him typing down there all the time. What if it's terrible? <laughs> what if he doesn't know what he's doing? I mean, uh, the movie hadn't come out yet, but what if it's like, a beautiful mind, you know, what if I just go off to this thing and I've just got cobwebs of yarn and stuff in there because nobody was allowed in my room. I mean, what if it's a madhouse? <laughs> well, the answer to that question is I would have been okay because I said to myself every day as I talked to a Mac picture of Max Perkins that I have up there, um, I'm giving you the best I can. I worked 27 days a month. I was working about 14 hours a day. I never went out. I didn't see people, didn't talk to people, didn't do anything. I just worked on that book. Now, if with my knowledge of the subject and all that work, if this book is no good, I'm clearly in the wrong business. I should be looking to do something else because there's no way I can devote more time, brains, or energy to anything. So, uh, so it was enough validation for me to say, yes, I want to go on to the second piece of apple pie. Um, and so here I am now, you know, on my fifth or sixth piece of apple pie. I think of Catherine Hepburn as, as the scoop of vanilla ice cream. She's the a la mode on top of the, on the slice of the pie. Uh, but, the, but in terms of giving advice, and I would say this, I think, um, I would say this, to an actor, I would say this to a painter. Um, the answer is you should act because you've got to act. Um, and if you, now, do I believe in, can you learn things in acting class? Sure, you can learn more technique as you can painting and even writing. But for writers, I would say, if you want to become a biographer, read a lot of biographies, which I have been doing since I was 15 years old. I just became obsessed with biographies. Uh, so you, you, you know the craft of it. And I never took a writing class. And I would say to you, if you want to go to a novel writing class, well, it's good exercise, um, but it's not going to give you talent. It will simply give you some discipline and it will give you a few tricks. It'll give you some technique, like but that. it's the same thing with acting, you know? Malcolm uh, Gladwell, 10,000 yes. hours. Yeah, well, there you go. That's it. Yeah, same joke. That's so I, I don't know if you divulge. I know you're you're finishing Thurgood Marshall sometime in the 21st century. Uh, yes. Can you can you give us a hint to who else you might want to be? Because I I can't wait to read that one and know who, who's next. Well, I'll be I'll be really honest with you. I I think Thurgood Marshall will be my last biography. Um. I always said to myself, I would do five or six of these, but I'm, you know, I'm now in my seventies. It takes a certain amount of brain power uh, to be able to do this because you've got to keep a whole life in your head for 10 years uh, until it's out. Um, and I just don't know that I'll have the physical energy or the brain power to do it. Um, you know, there was a wonderful biographer, William Manchester, uh, who was into the third volume of a trilogy he was doing on Winston Churchill when he realized he was starting to just lose it. His mind was going and he never finished it. And they went to some other people looking for a biographer. They, they called me, asked if I'd be interested in, in finishing it up, which, which I, w I wasn't really. Um, but I, I just have to tell myself uh, there might be a limit to what I can do here. Also, because most biographers uh, don't do all their own research. I'm, I'm, I'm a one-man band. I, I do everything myself. Um, and I always said I would do the five or six books, and then I would do a book of memoirs. Because 
you know, I've met a lot of fascinating people. Catherine Hepburn was not the only one who was fascinating. Um, you know, when I, um, each of my books, I mean, Anne Marlo Lindbergh was, was an incredible character. Doing the Goldwyn book, I mean, it wasn't just Hepburn and, and some silent screen stars, Anne Myrna Loy, but it was also Betty Davis and Sylvia Sidney and Barbara Stanwyck and those people I got to meet. Lillian Helm and I became friendly with, John Huston became friendly with. And then those directors, I was the last person to get to that generation of William Wyler, George Cukor, Billy Wilder, King Vidor, Henry King was 94 when I met him, uh, still sharp as a tack. Uh, Henry Hathaway, uh, God, uh, these, these directors were just phenomenal. Uh, so just to be able to write my tales of them, my, my day with Joel McRae out at his ranch, maybe oh, wow. just one of, the, one of the most joyous days of my life, you well, know, with the up, most charming up, man I'd ever met. Hurry up and finish Thurgood because that sounds like something I can't wait to read. Yeah, so. yeah, that was just heaven. Just, you know, God. so all that's, so, so that's, that I, I think is. I can't tell you, I'm well, gonna no. ask Jen Clymer to come back on, but I gotta tell you, this is one of the most fascinating hour and a half I've ever spent. Uh, you are not, I mean, yeah, listen, I hope everybody else gets to, gets to hear all the rest of the stories, but uh, you can tell Kevin that I'm taking you, as soon as COVID's over, <laughs> I'm taking you to dinner and I'm not letting you go home. <laughs> well, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, be sure, be sure you buy dinner uh, before you take me home. Um, and be sure you get me a get me a drink or two because the stories definitely get better when I have a drink or two in my okay. Life. I'll well, definitely. Be one, I'll be the one at the bar bringing you the drink. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, usually you usually have one question left, right? I do, and I actually, if it's okay with you, Hawk, I have one additional question. Sure. Early on um, in my time with MPTF, I was here for uh, Stanley Kramer's memorial that was held at the Directors Guild. Yep. And there was a wonderful person that stood in front of everyone and gave a, uh, a letter that Catherine had written about Stanley to be read at, to eulogize him. That was you, wasn't it? Actually, it wasn't. It, it wasn't me who wrote. I, I did. Uh, and when you asked me the question, I thought at first you were asking me if, if I had written that letter, which I had not. She did all her own writing. Um, uh, but no, it, it it wasn't me. But we talked about that a lot. In fact, I remember because I wasn't back east at that time. But we we talked about you know what she could say. Yeah, it it was a really touching heartbreaking letter because that relationship yeah. was also very important well that relationship was wonderful to her what she loved most about stanley kramer was how wonderfully kind and generous he was to spencer tracy in what was not just his last movie but his last moments i mean he was i mean he died shortly after i mean within days of finishing his shooting in the movie so yeah uh, so she yeah she loved him for that she really did and it indeed won her another Oscar. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Here, here are the two big questions that we end these interviews with. It is important because we're compiling a list of all of the greatest movies and greatest television shows. Ooh. Oh, right. What is your favorite film and what is your favorite TV series? Oh gosh, okay. And, and, and it's just a favorite film. A favorite so I, film. So I can't say I love Philadelphia Story and African Queen and Best Years of Our Lives and well, what I, if it's I, that's I'll, good. I'll, I'll offer you but, this: we've yes. added, added your favorite genre, and some people have made that okay. I want to say all Jodie Foster movies or all <laughs> Mel Brooks movies. You can Mine are across. You know what? I, here's the here's the one movie that if it pops up on TV or or wherever. If there's a single frame of it, I, I'm there for the entire picture. And that is uh, Some Like It Hot. I just think that is the greatest American comedy ever made. There is not a bad moment in it. And Nobody's I, perfect. I, love, I, I love Billy Wilder to death. I, I loved him, love his films. 
love Sunset Boulevard. Nothing captures that that Madge Kennedy uh, moment of those transitional silent screen stars, what happened to them. But Some Like It Hot is just pure joy to me. Pure yep. joy. Yep. And a TV sh and a TV show, TV series. <sighs> Again, I'm torn here between a show my father produced, which was the Chrysler Theater, which was the last of the dramatic anthology shows in which he got the likes of Simone Signore and Anne Bancroft and Jason Robards and, and just all sorts of to, to appear in one hour TV dramas with budding directors like Sidney Pollack, you know, starting out and so forth. So I loved that. And we were Twilight Zone freaks, my three brothers and I. So in a way, that's my favorite series, but I'm going to come clean with you. That for 35 years or so, I have been watching The Bold and the Beautiful. <laughs> and that's, if you want an honest answer, that's the answer. I watched, I watched The Young and the Restless for 15 years before that. But then they changed times on me, so I couldn't have my lunch break during Young and Restless. And I saw the very first episode of Bold and Beautiful and they just, it's hard for me to get through. It's hard for me to get through a day or a week without it. I, I can tell you I you're can gonna call be, up past episodes now, you know? You're gonna be the only one who has, has that. Has that? Well, but if you saw what Quinn, that slut is doing right now <laughs> with Carter, who's this straight arrow, why he is cheating with, un, uh, sleeping, with his boss's wife. I mean, this is just, this is insanity that, that they're doing this, but. Scott, you, know, you, you are one unique, amazing human being. Thank you for being with us. This was just fantastic. Well, well thank you. I love the MPTF, everything it does, everything it stands for. I've tried to play a small role through Kevin with real stories and real lives was there at the beginning with that. Um, but I, I so love the organization. The more I learn about it that, you know, I, I thought of it in the beginning as just the home and just to see how it treats the whole of life, you know, it takes care of the family. And, and there's, there's not another industry that I know of where we take care of our own, it's that simple. Um, and they don't just talk about it. MPTF does it. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank Scott. you. I'm, well, it was a it was a pleasure for me to do this. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Yes. You're very welcome. My pleasure. My and pleasure. Also, thank you so much for not just this series, but also Inside Hollywood and everything that you have brought to make creative chaos. <laughs> telling and and shareable wow. we want to get it out to even more people to to hear these amazing stories and uh to hear the plot twists that old and the beautiful is uh top of your television series that's amazing and i just showed you the tip of the iceberg of old and beautiful whoa <laughs> i'm i got hey, 35 sir, years of stories oh stories. sorry sorry i have just a little quick announcement uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, in June, uh, we have two pretty amazing people who we're going to interview. First, Nancy Myers, and then the Fonz, Henry Winkler. Wow. So hey. Look forward to those. We'll see, it. we'll see you next month, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.